Research podcast where we share the super cool backstories and side gigs of the research and insights pros that you trust. In fact, it is a very special episode of the podcast today. It is episode number 100. Somehow I made it to triple digits. I'm so stoked about that because, uh, hey, I didn't know if people were going to listen to this thing or not, but uh, people are, so that's great. Uh, I am going to be welcoming back uh, guest. Uh, Lee Kessler from episode 93. Ta-da! <laughs> Welcome back! back Lee. Welcome back! Good to be here! <laughs> we have some amazing stuff to talk about. This crazy melding of research and music, which is what this podcast is all about. Yeah. This is I mean, fun. really, it, it's in the title. I mean... <laughs> That's right. You put it in the pot, and here we're just really stirring it around. Like, better than anything I've seen. So I'm super excited to talk about that, Lee, but you're going to have to hold your horses because, hey, it's the 100th episode, so I got to share some cool stuff, right? Yeah, you got to uh, celebrate. Gonna, yeah, that's right. I've, I've got some fun facts. I have some fun facts. People ask me some things, and, you know, this is, this is research, so I've got some numbers. I got a story or two. Uh, so first of all, okay, so over 100 episodes... So far, we've had 13, a little over 13,000 listens and downloads. So that's really cool. Um, it was really exciting to pass the 10,000 mark. We're over 13,000 now. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but for something super niche like this, it feels okay to me. <laughs> so, so that's pretty cool. I have another, I have another number for you. Um, I've been using my LinkedIn page for the Rock and Roll Research Podcast is kind of my de facto hub, I guess, homepage-ish. Uh, we've gone over 1,500 followers on LinkedIn. So if you don't follow us on LinkedIn, then please do, because I share some, some cool things on there. In addition to when the new episodes come out, one thing that I shared recently is, uh, is something about the Desert Island discs that our guests choose. Every episode, I ask each guest, which three desert island discs they would like to have them keep or keep them company if they were stranded on a desert island. Uh, and so, of course, since this is research, that's quantitative data right there. It's gold. So I can tell you that by far the number one band uh, that gets mentioned. Can you guess it, Lee? Do you have any idea? Um, based on me and others, I would guess the Grateful Dead, but I know it's not the Grateful Dead. <laughs> It is not, in fact, it is the legendary Beatles. Oh, um, not, all, bad. not bad. All sorts of different albums, you know, whether it's the White Album or Rubber Soul or whatever the case. I'm not a Beatles expert, but all I know is that the Beatles are by far number one. I did make a post on LinkedIn a couple months ago, though, uh, that listed the top 10 most mentioned bands. What's really cool is that they're all over the map. There's metal and there's hip hop and there's R&B and there's classic rock and all kinds of crazy stuff in there. So uh, you can dig into my post to find that out. Uh, but Beatles are number one. Uh, I also, I'm not gonna change anytime soon unless I start getting more Slayer uh, fans on here, which is hmm. a goal of mine. <laughs> I wonder, by the way, Matt, how many people get inspired to listen after they hear the three? Because I heard your interview with, uh, was, you did Pepper Miller, I think, not so long yeah. ago. She yeah. talked about Nelly, my place. Yes. Yeah. And, which I always love, but she mentioned like the intro to it. I was like, and I'm driving along listening. I was like, oh, what is that intro? And I heard it and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I listened like four times in a row. So yeah, I think you're oh. probably, you know, sharing the the ether with more music because of that. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I have gotten some really cool recommendations, actually, from that top three. So it's the long tail, just, just so often is the case. It's a long tail that's really interesting. So uh, so, so cool stuff, cool stuff there. Uh, another fun fact here. Uh, so sometimes people ask me, you know, hey, what are the most popular episodes? Well, I have that for you. I've got the top five. Um I got him right here. So number five, by the way, is Jordan Kuzner, who's episode number two, who's currently the head of guest insights at Popeyes. Jordan's a good dude. Uh, number four, clocking in at number four, is Larry Chang from uh, from Intuit. 
He's a great UX designer and researcher, episode number 61. Uh, number three most listened to episode is Mark Hazansky, episode 90. He's a senior client partner uh, at Oracle Life Services, recently rebranded. Number two, here we're getting to the big stuff here. Number two, episode number 23 is Winfred Sampson from Insight Sutras, and based in India, a uh, business partner of mine as well. Uh, and number one, uh, pretty much by far, is Elisa Ben, episode number 29, head of analytics at Canvas. Every one of them has a really cool backstory or side gig for sure. Um, I won't articulate them here because you should just go listen to the episodes. So that's plan four. <laughs> All right, so uh, one thing I do want to say is, you know, I've learned so much, I must say, uh, about research, about music, about all kinds of stuff. I discovered lots of podcasts and media from various guests. Um, I will say the one thing that I am super proud of that I didn't really expect is that um, people have found this as a place, some guests have really found this as a place to tell a story that they really haven't, haven't shared at all. Um, so they've, they've lived compartmented lives. Here's their personal life. Here's their research life and never the twain shall meet. And some guests have come on and, and really told their story to industry for the first time. And that was a very meaningful and sometimes emotional experience for them. Uh, and so uh, I was asked then to, uh, to moderate a couple of panels for the Insights Association on bringing your whole self to work as the, the idea was that this is a, a good vehicle for doing that and some contributing to that in some way. So I'm super thankful for that. I'm glad people see that. It wasn't necessarily the intention, but, uh, but is a, a beautiful um, outcome of uh, what we're doing here on the podcast. So that's really cool. Um, so that's it. That's, uh, that's a real quick synopsis of where we are today. I'm just going to keep steaming full, full bore with more guests. I told myself I'd stop this whole thing once people stop listening, but fortunately I have really interesting guests. So if you're sick to death of me, which some of you might be, uh, you're still tuning in for the guests. So, uh, so we'll keep doing it. So there's an endless supply. Keep it up, Matt. You're good at it. And it is real <laughs> fun. And when you run into other people who a listened or just, you know, at a conference and you meet other people who've also been on, it's such a fun thing to share and discuss. So, uh, so d don't let it go away. It's too yeah. fun. Cool merch too. So the best go. merch. <laughs> All right. So, so why Lee Kessler? Why Lee Kessler? Why is he back on? So, if you listen to the episode number ninety three, you know that Lee was previously a stand up comedian. Still does, you know, knocks things around a little bit in that space here and there. Um, but interestingly enough, and we didn't touch on this too much in the episode, but Lee is also a musician playing in a band, singing in a band, doing some cool stuff. Uh, and that's a relatively new hobby, uh, but he's gotten good fast, which, uh, which is really cool. Um, now, here's the backstory on, on this. So uh, I asked Lee if he would speak at a conference, the Insights Association annual uh, Southwest Conference combined with the West Conference, blah, 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 lots of stuff. It was in Las Vegas in September. <laughs> so um, Lee did this really amazing uh, uh, talk about applying the insights uh, from a career in comedy to market research. And I really couldn't believe how tight those insights were and what I learned from them. But he surprised me and surprised everybody with this amazing uh, analysis, call it analysis, uh, that, uh, again, takes takes music, takes research, puts it in a pot, stirs it up. I'm in the pot. <laughs> and so it, the whole thing just blew me away. And so yeah. I thought we would we would talk a little bit about that today. So I thought more people would like to hear it. So welcome back, Lee. Well, thank you, Matt, and congratulations, Mazel Tov, to you on uh, 100, and uh, uh, it's it's amazing show, and I love being part of it, and um, and I love our friendship because of it, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, cool. I'm super happy to have you back, and I'm glad we're friends, and I'm glad that I'm friends with a lot of the guests that have been on this podcast. It's been really cool, um, but okay, so 
So, so this presentation, what was this about, right? Yeah, here we are in <laughs> Vegas, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's me on the screen, and and I'm part of a survey, and everything was just crazy cool. So tell us a little bit about that. So it stemmed from, um, you know, wanting to do something. Uh, I wanted to do something at the present when I presented as part of my presentation that. You know, you as a comedian or wherever you're performing, you want to connect with the audience and 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 find your common uh, thing. And uh, it, it, this seemed like an easy thing to do it, but also something that I just thought could be a lot of fun. Um, which was that. So, I, you know, I, I obviously I did stand up for many years, and I was a professional at stand up, and so. Whether or not you think I'm good at stand up, I clearly was good enough that some people paid me a lot of money to do it. So there, <laughs> I was that good, right? Yeah. Um, but since it, in the past couple of years, I got into being in a band and just started by being the front man. Um, it came to just a guy I knew who got together with other great musicians. They jammed and invited me to come over. And then I was singing, and I'm not a singer, um, but I'm obviously a performer. And as a stand-up comedian, I did impressions. And so I'm good with my voice. So like I can karaoke really well because yeah. I can put on a show and I can sound good. Um, but if I'm singing like a Bruce Springsteen song, I'm going to sound like Bruce Springsteen. Right. And part of my journey in the past, you know, four years of doing this music stuff has been um, developing my own voice and trying to figure out how to sound and sing like myself because yeah. when we, all performers do this you we we imitate um i do you do it in stand up you know when you're just learning how to do it you're going to imitate the people who inspire you and who you love and so when i started i felt sounded very much like seinfeld and george carlin when i first started stand up like right. i even did my act i sounded like i had a long island accent like it was <laughs> You just can't help it, but you're there's so many things you're trying to figure out that copying is the easiest thing. And because I naturally am a mimic and I did impressions, that all that was very natural. But eventually I learned in stand-up how to have my voice, how to speak like myself, and how my thoughts were my own. And this was the real Lee Kessler. You know, it's funny you said before, why Lee Kessler? You know, who is Lee Kessler? You have to tell that to people. And yeah and communicating who I am. And so whatever I'm saying, it has to feel authentic and real. And that's what I learned from standup. And that's what finding your voice is. And that's what I think a big part of insights is, is our, we help companies, businesses, messages get articulated, which is about finding the voice, making sure that we sound to the outside, we're presenting ourselves to the outside world, the way we think of ourselves and what we want them to know. And right. um, that's what the stand-up journey is. Uh, and that's what my musical journey has been. So anyways, this yeah. presentation was recording myself singing, playing guitar. And we used, uh, I'm at Mercury Analytics. We have all this technology uh, at our hands for research. And I was like, I'm going to dial test myself performing <laughs> and yeah. find out, am I any good at singing? Because for two reasons, first, my mom always told me I'm a terrible singer. So <laughs> I believe her and I'm trying to get over that. <laughs> um, and then the other is because I want to perform more in in front of real live crowds. And this yeah. was a way to kind of move me down and like see, all right, well, what would people think? Could I perform in front of real audiences? So that was the goal uh, with this in, in, in addition to entertaining everybody. Yeah, sure. So I think you I think you have some slides. Is that right? I do. I have my slides from my presentation where which walk you through like what I learned about um sing myself. So I'm Yeah, gonna... this is really cool. While, while you're pulling that up and and I know if you're listening to this on audio, I'm sure that Lee will uh, make it come to life with words. Um but what I think is really interesting is so you used to a much different method when you were a stand-up comic, like let's say a budding stand-up comic, you know, trying to get that feedback. I mean, it feels more like it's trial by fire, right? You get in front of people and and your survey, if you will, is either they laugh or they don't. Uh, but here it's like before going out and performing, uh, now that you're a market researcher and you've got these tools at your disposal, 
uh, you can get that feedback much more quickly, right? You're exactly right. I mean, that's the thing about standup is you, you, the thing about music is like to learn how to play guitar. I can play guitar. I can practice. I can go on YouTube. I can get a teacher. I can spend months, years learning to play guitar before I ever step in front of a live audience. So the yeah. first time people see me play guitar, they'll be like, wow, he's really good because I've been able to practice the craft, learn the instrument. The thing about stand-up is you need to be in front of people. The instrument you're playing is an audience of strangers and right. you can't do it at home. Um, so you do get much more real feedback. The thing is, I've been doing this music thing in people's basements for the past year. I'm not in front of a real audience. So this allowed me to sort of test myself. So yeah, um, cool. hopefully you see my screen. Yep. Um, the song I did was John Prine's Angel from Montgomery. Yeah, great song. And the, the one of the reasons I chose it was it's one of my favorite songs of all time. I love John Prine. I love this song. And after I talked about his him being one of my three discs on an island, you sent me a link of you and some band members performing this same song. And I thought it was amazing. So um, that's kind of what kicked off the inspiration here. So. Yeah, cool. So we did a dial test. So uh, if you're not, obviously, if you're listening, you can't see it. But those watching, you, you can see the screen in front of you. But I, we did a dial test. I, we reused a real um, random sample, sent it out to 100 people using the same thing we would do with any client. Um, so we had uh, 103 gen pop. And then um, I also sent it out to friends and loved ones to find out what people close to me would say so I could get a comparison. So 127 total people. 103 gen pop, 24 amongst my friends. And then I actually, we did some open end questions to get feedback, you know, not just where do you rank this person, but why, and what advice would you have for them? And then ran it through AI. Mercury, our platform has AI analysis of open end questions. So I was like, all right, what can I learn from that? <laughs> right? Yeah. So this is... That's you. That's me. I'm Matt, a local legend, says the shirt. And uh, you can hear it okay? Yep. Yeah. I am a new woman named after my mother. My old man is another child that's grown old. No. It dreams for thunder. So I'll turn that down a little bit. So those not watching, listening, there. this is being dial tested and we yeah. starts at 50, you hear me singing and I pretty much go between 50 and 65 the whole way. I never go down. Um, I go up a little bit and down a little bit, but for the most part, I hovered where I didn't lose them, which was- Sounds good immediately. It sounds good, by the way. Thank you. Well, you're an extremely nice person though, Matt. It's not, you're not a good gauge, I don't think. <laughs> Um, so, but that was what, what people saw. We, that's what the, we asked the questions. Then they saw that video and dial tested it. Um, yeah. and here are some of the different audiences that I put it in front of, and, and I'll walk through who they are. These um, are your ringers, right? Pardon me? These are your ringers. So just in case the general public doesn't like it, you can kind of. Right. Well, your I mean, parents know. Feel good about it. <laughs> yeah. How would people I know react and, you know, um, yeah. Who knew what I was trying to do? So my parents, my wife, my daughters, as you see here, they're 15 and 11. Uh, my best friend from ch kid, childhood was the manager of a band called the Disco Biscuits. So <laughs> I knew he knew it. My wife's best friend's husband manages Train and Green Day and a bunch of bands. So like he knows music. Wow. So I got some good people to listen. Cool. So here is the data, what the data tells us. Um, yeah. And the, the, uh, the pink line is my friends. The G green line is Gen Pop. My friends were obviously much nicer than Gen Pop. I started <laughs> at 50, kind of went up to 74 and hung around 74 on the ranking, whereas um, Gen Pop started at 50, got up to around 60 something, uh, and then kind of went up and down and up and down and Peter topped out at around 63, probably with that group. Yeah, yeah not bad. Not bad. Um, I broke it down into musicians. One of the questions we asked was, 
you know, have you ever performed an instrument in front of played an instrument in front of an audience? Because I thought that was relevant. Yeah. Um, and people who have never played, people who have, people who maybe played as a student. Uh, and the interesting thing, and no, no, not really a surprise, was that um, people who play music or have played before scored it much higher. They were yeah. much more impressed with what what I was doing, whereas people who didn't play or it's been years, you know, again, all around 50 and 65, but the others uh, took me a bit higher. So that was nice to see. Yeah, so that, that makes you the critically acclaimed Lee Kessler. So critically acclaimed. Even, yeah, exactly. even if you don't sell any records, you know, the critics, you're, if, you're with the critics. If you know, <laughs> you know, right? And like, if they know music, you know this guy's not bad. Um, live music goers, one of the questions we asked was people who, uh, have you seen, you know, a live music event in the past year? More than two, four. Uh, and no surprise, those who'd been four or more, super high. That was my best ranking up into the 70s. Um, yeah. Those who never went to music events, they were on the low point. So again, that's great data because the ones who don't go to music events aren't going to be there. Right. <laughs> you know? So I'm looking for people who do go to live music and, and I scored okay with them. Yeah, cool. Um, male versus female. Clearly, I did much better with females than males. <laughs> and I got to tell you, if I'm going to do better with one of those groups, you know, <laughs> the group I'd rather do better with. <laughs> it's like Robin Williams and Dead Poets says, why do we write poetry to woo women? So I feel like <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of the same. Um, <laughs> at Mercury, we do a lot with, with political. Uh, sure. And a lot of times we're looking at political groups. So I was like, all right, Democrats versus Republicans versus independents. Uh, I did best with Democrats, no question. Uh, Republicans kind of became uninterested in me after a while, which I thought maybe the country vibe would do well, but didn't yeah. seem to matter. You know what? I, I kind of wonder, just, just, just to jog aside, just thinking about John Prine, right? He's very country oriented, but he's been welcomed by sort of the Americana audience. So that's more his space rather than, you know, rather than George Jones or whatever, you know, deep country, yeah. he's kind of got this, this broader yeah. appeal. He's not honky tonk country. I mean, right. right. More of a Bob Dylan of a poet slash. Yeah. 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 Know, yeah. Music, yep. For sure. Yeah. Wait, and I'll talk about that because part of the analysis I got, Th that really comes into play about the song I chose. You'll see where I talk about that. Um, so that's how I did around against everybody else, uh, you know, into different groups. But then I thought, all right, well, we have here, you know, two, two variables have been taking place. The same song that you and your band did and that I did. So I said, all right, well, let me test me against you and your band <laughs> playing the same song. Mono. Let's Mana, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't get more real than that. So here, let me quick, quick backstory, quick backstory. Uh, yeah, quick backstory before you show the clip or play the clip. So this was COVID era, um, deep, deep within the pandemic. I took my drum kit out to middle of nowhere, Texas, and contributed a drum track to some old rockabilly and country guys. I used to play with in Minneapolis many a year ago. So anyway, go ahead. Right. And it was awesome. And you sent this to me and I was like, he's so good. They are so good. I just loved it. Um, and it gave me a good baseline for what I considered a much better performance, you know, because um, it eliminated and you'll see it eliminates the, is it a different song? Do people like the song? Same song. So here's you guys playing. I am an old woman Named after my mother My old man's another Child that's grown old You are driving in the car If dreams are lightning Thunder desire This old house will burn down A long time ago Make me an angel That flies from Montgomery Make me a poster of an old road. Just give me one thing that I can hold on to. 
to believe in this living is just a hard way to go. Here's my favorite part. It's slide guitar. I love that sound. Man. Good guitar. Yeah. Okay, research question for you here, Lee. Research question. So, did each respondent see both of these, and were the were the orders random order? They, everybody saw both, but it was random order. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. There we go. Please don't insult me, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's the no, Rock and Roll Research Podcast. I got to follow all the best practices. Are you kidding? Yeah, that was bad form on my part. So. <laughs> yeah, you owe me one. <laughs> um. But I, I mean, I loved it. And you can hear, I mean, you guys are so polished, such a professional sound. Uh, it, it was just, I, I love just listening to you guys play. Um, so, but I, we, we dial tested, compared the two. So we'll see how did we do. Um, so you can see here, um, Gen Pop is uh, the green line, per pink is the, my friends. Yeah. Um, Gen Pop, we you did better. You could see that you come closer to that 70 line much more than I do. Um, I'm proud to say, though, with my friends, I did better. <laughs> they got your back. <laughs> they got my back. It, I stacked the deck, and it paid off as far as the testing did. But overall, you could see general population, you were stronger. Um, country fans was, I was surprised, but I you, you those not can't see it. Um, again, Matt did slightly better in Gen Pop, um, uh, and my f uh, my friends who are country fans liked Matt's versions better as well. Um, but overall, I was I was happy to say that because yeah. I love country music, that's what I would you know, love playing. That's what I go to hear the most. So it was neat to see that the people that I most love the same kind of music, we were aligned. Uh, Pretty comparable, yeah, yeah. Uh, my buddy from the Disco Biscuits. <laughs> Uh, I've isolated him, and here you can see I, I start out, he gets he, and he starts sending me to the top, pushing me around 100. Um, I got there about 40 seconds and stayed there, so he seemed to like it. Um, you, and same kind of pattern with you, he likes it, and, and you guys are up in the, uh, the high 80s here. Um, but there is a dip, and when I was looking at that, I was like, try to figure out that dip. Uh, and my thought was that it's my, my buddy was like, wait a second, I'm probably being too nice and Lee wants to do better. <laughs> so I felt like that was kind of being against gamed, uh, the stack gamed in my favor. Everybody needs a buddy like that. <laughs> Everybody needs a buddy who <laughs> bends the odds for you. Um, here's my buddy from, uh, who, who manages uh train. Um, and you could see he, he, he liked me better early on kind of went with it and hit the 75 it's where I ended uh it took a little bit more longer for you guys but he got you guys got there the same and in the end I mean I look at it where do you end is a big part of it right we both ended right about a little under 75 with him so uh, sure. uh this <laughs> my wife <laughs> this is my wife's reaction um so again uh Compared to Gen Pop, um, <laughs> my expectations of you, Lee. This was oh, horrible. Yeah. She didn't start even like liking me until about fifty seconds in, and then slightly goes up. Whereas you, it took but maybe ten seconds for her to like you, and stayed very high the entire way. So there's no question. If given the chance to see the two of us, <laughs> my wife would select you. <laughs> The data don't it's lie. It's a novelty. I don't know. She's seen a lot of you over the years. That's <laughs> true. Yeah, she knows what she's getting. Well, she's seen the stand-up, and she's like, I really don't need to watch that guy again. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I will say I did notice there was that same drop um, yeah. that I saw the first time. And that so as a, a researcher, uh, that became interesting to me. My daughters, um, <laughs> So here they are. My uh, my my youngest daughter is the purple line. My oldest daughter is the green line. Uh, my oldest daughter, I think, kind of saw us the same way. Uh, she sort of starts liking it around the same place. I did dip down with her a little bit, but came up. Um, <laughs> but and then stayed high, finishing at eighty-two. 
she had you finish in the same place. But again, I noticed that dip took place. My younger yeah. daughter, who's 11, um, tough crowd. She, she liked me better from the beginning, and you never even got close. And <laughs> I, and that's why she's my favorite. <laughs> She she is like no nope, nobody's better than my dad, so uh, so she gave me good insights there. Um, so interestingly, I looked into that dip because you've, I've seen it now three times. I saw it a couple of places. Right. And so because of the dial test, I know the exact moment it happened, and it was when the the slide guitar came on. Ah, mm -hmm. yeah. Polarizing. It's, it's polarizing, and it's funny because. If you're trying to use this to get better, you know, obviously you'd look at it and say, okay, do we need to improve something there or or whatnot? But it's just so interesting because when I listen to it and I hear that slide guitar, I love it. So the mm -hmm. fact that some people don't feel that same thing surprises me, but that's why we do research, right? Yeah. Yep. Um you, Matt, we tested you <laughs> to see how you compared the two of us. <laughs> and um you know, you were very I like nice to me. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> you were very nice to me, and you got me up there and hung me around ninety for most of the time. With you guys, you got up to you were bored. You were closer to the hundreds. You thought you were absolutely perfect. Um, and I like I, my bandmates. <laughs> I, I ain't got no beef with that, man. I you love you, and that's the only way you do this is by believing you're the best of the group. So no problem. <laughs> the last though is my parents. Um, which was the big thing behind this. Cause I told you, I grew up and my mom was like, you can't sing. And I have supportive parents. Like they were all about me going into stand up. So they're not, and they're not the reason I'm a stand up. It's not like I hate my parents. Like I loving supportive parents, but they were both always like, they study opera. My parents, they study Broadway. Like they really know stuff. And my mom was always like, you can't sing. You're a great entertainer. So I wanted to know what she thought. Um, so here you see my parents judging the two of us. Um, they like me a little better than you. Um, right. You like you, you kind of went below 50 and never got above. I went below 50 and eventually at the very end, uh, I got above 50, but it's kind of all irrelevant because compared to Gen Pop and my friends, <laughs> My parents didn't like either one as <laughs> anywhere <laughs> here as my friends or Gen Pop like me. So uh, I just can't win it. I can't win with my folks is basically what the change is to It doesn't matter how good I'd ever be. I'm not going to impress my parents. <laughs> um, Too funny. And then lastly, answering the big question of could I perform in a venue? Uh, we looked at Gen Pub, uh, Gen, uh, Gen Pop, and and my friends. Uh, with my friends, eighty seven percent thought ranked me in the top three boxes. Probably good enough, or definitely good enough. Um, general public, sixty one percent had me in the top three boxes. That's still pretty good. Not not bad. Certainly, my friends are going to come see me anyway, so they they seem to like it. So how does that compare to you? Because that would be the gauge. And my friends had you at eighty eight percent. Gen Pop had you at 84%. So uh, you can see the difference there. You guys were more professional. You were much more of what people going to see music would expect to see. And I'm inspired to keep on getting better. Nice. Yeah. Um, so what's really interesting, though, as I was talking about before, about finding your voice. I also wanted to use this to learn and get better, right? And like, mm -hmm. okay, so the data tells me this, Matt's better. I knew Matt was better. You know, um, I see the areas where of improvement, except, you know, how did it rank? I was above 50. Okay, good enough. But um, I ran it through AI, um, through our AI to find out, like, if I took all that, what people were saying in the comments, what could I learn? Right. And when I ran it through my friends, uh, one of the things we we have is called uh, main themes and best quotes, which is kind of like open end themes. You know, you you code and it's it's mm -hmm. that and the quotes that back it up. So volume control, authenticity, and emotion were touched on. Technique improvement. These are my friends, mostly complimentary here. 
Um, sure. uh, um, and some people were, were honest, uh, out of tune at times, overly emphatic facial expressions. So they told me some things I needed to know. The things like volume control, the things that were related to the environment where I played it, I, you need, I needed to cancel that out because I know like I wasn't on a real mic. It wasn't well produced. So those bits of advice, you know, you could have dressed better. I got yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> All fine. Um, one of the things I did see here in the quotes, and, I, and I'll talk about it, was somebody wrote, be more happy, but otherwise really well on eye contact. Yeah. And, that struck me the be more happy. Um, and it's why I love qual because it gives you these things that you weren't looking for. Um, when I did the same thing, looking at gen pop, um, a lot of need for improvement, 48% singer needs to practice more and more lessons. Um, positive feedback. I did get 25%. Great job. Nice singing. Um, Technical adjustments, 15%. So better need a better mic, sing towards the front. Again, that's stuff that's easy to change. Sure. <clears throat> um, th so that was the main themes and quotes. Then I looked at the summary. And this is where it got, as somebody like me, who's really on this journey of trying to get better and trying to be the best performer that I know I can be because I did it in another realm. Mm -hmm. um, this is what was interesting. So... Um, so things like you know several comments about the need for the singer to take vocal lessons um ouch <laughs> yeah but i get it they're right you know um there was good things phrases like keep it up good voice was repeated yeah. um singer was often drowned out, out by the guitars um there were calls for a better sound system so again those are easily fixed that's not as much about me except you know singer needs to take vocal lessons um but here were other things. Many found the tune uninspiring and slow. There were concerns about the singer's song choice and delivery of lyrics. Yeah. Many found the performance flat, unengaging, and lacking in unique qualities that would make the singer stand out. Mm. Um, which is interesting because the presentation that I gave in Vegas, which I give as part of my keynote, it's called Stand Out Like a Stand Up. Right. And I, it's really about how to stand out. And the fact that some people's comments were assessed as like, he didn't stand out was really interesting to me. And yeah, possible. that is interesting. Um, and then lastly, potential issue of target audience mismatch where the singer style or genre, genre didn't resonate. So you see here, good, you know, could do better from training, um, need enhanced clarity but doesn't have a unique quality to make them stand out. And there might've been a mismatch with the singer's style. Um, and that, that's it, so. Yeah, it's, it's interesting too, because there was that, you made that point about somebody saying to be more happy. And I just think about this song and it's such a melancholy. And I mean, if you really listen to the lyrics is an incredibly uh, depressing, no future type of, song right so how can you be happy when you're singing a song like that absolutely right and i didn't think of, because i love the song so much and right. you know it's funny angel from montgomery i live in montgomery county and like so there's this part of me that like john Prine is my angel from montgomery um but you know there there is was this feeling of putting myself out there to do this in the first place right to record myself and i felt like i had his backing behind me and the song that I believe in, I was like, I know I can do it if John Prine's spirit is with me. Right. But it, but it was interesting that, like, exactly you say, that is a song that he wrote, but it really was made famous by Bonnie Raitt. And right. today is person. made famous yeah. by Susan Tedeschi from Tedeschi Trucks. Mm -hmm. So it's told from the perspective of a woman. Right. And like you said, it's the story of a woman who's, like, given up on life. Right. And it all has passed her by and she doesn't have much left except this man in the other room who's just like used to be a good looking cowboy and now ain't nothing. Right. Um, and I, that was sort of the lesson for me was that's not my story to tell. Um, and like you said, that comment about be more happy when I do stand up, when I did stand up and the act that I, I built was about 
loving life and being a happy person. And like, I wasn't angry. My my stand up was funny. Life is funny. Life is great. Life's enjoyable. I, I like I kid and make fun of myself, but we all do these things. But yeah. it's finding the reasons to see the beauty in life, and that's not what this song is. Um, and I have since practiced, started practicing songs that are songs that can tell my story, and I hear it. Just I feel so much better singing it because I'm not. I can tell this story. It's my voice. Right, right. It's really interesting. Yeah, that's such a fascinating lesson to learn. You know, it's that it's that it's that match, right? It's that match to really be your authentic self, I guess, if you're uh if you're delivering something uh, you know, as as a singer. So it's it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I I never it's been part of the enjoyment of this journey, but like, I never realized, um, you know, the thing, the thing about lyrics is lyrics are stories. They should be, they're, they're telling a story of some sort. Uh -huh. Um, but they're also, they are the difference between, I think we've talked about this, but like the difference between stand up and singing is that stand up's about words. I'm saying words. You ever notice that? You ever notice this? Isn't it funny how we all do this? They're words. They're done in a in a sing songy way, but right. Whereas singing is pushing air through your vocal cords in the shape of the words, right? It's the right. It's the same thing the guitarist is making, the vibration, and it's what the piano player is, is playing. The horns are blowing. It's air moving through, and the lyrics are just a, a structure around that sound, and that's the story that's getting told. It's not the same as stand-up. It's a very different thing. I've never heard anybody talk about that, but that is what I've learned. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting way to look at it. So what are the what are the implications for you or some of maybe the big lessons going from stand up, which you essentially mastered, uh, versus that, uh, that's mighty kind of a <laughs> No, <laughs> no. Uh, I saw your work. I thought it was great. So uh, yeah. clearly, clearly, I got to a professional paid level. There we call it. <laughs> clearly, you're a pro. I'm not going to be doing the head to head of my comedy versus yours. Let me put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see bigger gaps for sure. Uh, but yeah. okay, so you've mastered that. Uh, but music, you're you're on this journey to uh, to hone your craft to really learn your craft. Yeah. So what are what are some of the differences or maybe similarities of that? Well, I think the, I mean, song select. I mean, exactly what the AI was telling me. You know, from this song selection is everything. So like the first song that after I read this and started thinking about it, the first song I started playing was uh, Van Morrison's Crazy Love. Oh right? yeah, yep. And it's a beautiful song about, you know, how he feels about the woman he loves. And that's a story I can tell. Right. And it's not a sad story. I mean, I can hear her heartbeat from a thousand miles. Like, it's so happy and beautiful. And mm -hmm. I just found, as I sang, that came out much more naturally sure. than an angel from Montgomery. Um, I also think that... Um, I mean, looking at the data and looking at what I've seen, I, I stand up was the thing that I can do. I can do stand up. Like I can get up, whether or not you not think I'm amazing and so funny. Yeah. Um, it's what I do. I studied it early. I figured it out early. It runs through who I am. I don't think I'm a, sing a singer. Um, I don't think I'll ever be a singer. And what I am is an entertainer. I love being a performer. I love being in front of people and I could put on a great show. Yeah. So I feel like my band playing, I'm going to sing more songs like, um, like one of the songs I love that we do, Billy Joel, You May Be Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much performance in there and there's so much attitude and like Billy yeah, Joel yeah. guy, like that's a story I can get behind, you know, loves a girl who's like ignoring him and he just wants to chant. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's much easier for me to get up in front of people and entertain them as the front man of an entire group than yeah. the one guy doing a beautiful solo. 
I just don't think it's me. I think I'm uh, um, I'm better suited as the front man who uh, I've also learned is the front man of a band is a lot like a quarterback. I played quarterback in high school football and like yeah. everything runs through you and you have to know everybody's jobs and you, it's yeah. all about your rhythm. And that's what I, that's what I tap into much more is that feeling of my job is to lead these guys, but it's not necessarily to show everybody that Lee's the best singer. Yeah. It's to show them Lee's a really good leader. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally true. That's absolutely true. Yeah, um, yeah cool. So, so let me say what I really like about this, right? Of course, it's research applied to music in a compelling way. But what I like too is that it's very action oriented, right? So you've got the results, and it's like, oh, okay. Now here's what I've learned. Here's how I'm going to apply it. Uh, and so you're talking about different. Um, different songs that you might incorporate to to better match your voice or your personality or who you are so it's more authentic is there anything else you know of the sort of little tidbits that that came out of that a any other changes or alterations you plan to make um no i think i mean that's what i want to try next i do want to do yeah. one I, I think i might do something where i record myself by myself again just to see how it sounds yeah, but but I think when people talked about, I'm still looking at it, like he doesn't have a unique quality to make him stand out. I think if people saw me as the yeah. front man of a band, they'd be like, "Oh yeah, he was great. That singer was great." Yeah, because it would be using the other things, and so yeah, um, the uh, that's kind of it's that's what it really is that motiv motivated me to do is I'm not interested in performing by myself I want to get my band more gigs and yeah. I want to get in front of a team of five guys performing um, yeah 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 interesting so just a side note because I just uh I'm a big fan of a band called the replacements from Minneapolis probably my all-time favorite band uh there was a biography on them called trouble boys and this is what that was about too where They've got this singer, Paul Westerberg, uh, who's sort of this mercurial genius, uh, and he eventually left the band and did a solo career, right. thinking because it was about him in a way, right? But at the end of the day, he didn't have that band behind him. He lost so much in the change um, that it's it's just fresh. <laughs> I finished it this weekend, so it's top of mind That's for me. Funny. Uh, it's good to hear you say, yes, it's uh, how do I make the band better by, you know, adjusting based on what I've learned rather than, oh, OK, I need to go just do my own thing. Right. Um, well, and so it's much funny. support there. Yeah. I mean, the the thing that I have learned about music the, is um, and all of this time together is the drummer. I mean, the importance of the drummer. It's everything. I mean, <laughs> It's funny, I used to look at the drummer and be like, like, I feel like that guy had the last choice in instrument. Like, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> one guy's like, oh, I'll be the guitar player. I'll play the other guitar. I'll do bass, I'll play piano. And there's one guy left, he's like, well, I wanna be in the band, I guess I'll drum. <laughs> but that's not it. I mean, the drummer is everything. The, the relationship between the lead singer and the drummer and the bassist, like when our basses can't come usually to practice, usually my drummer's like, I, I'll, I'll see you guys next week. <laughs> totally, no you know? bass. Then, <laughs> that's when I first started learning it, but I, I, the the relationship that he and I have, um, and to go back to football, it's very much reminds me of the quarterback in the center that, yeah. you know, the, the the play doesn't have in football, the play doesn't happen if you can't get the snap from the center to the quarterback. And it's right yeah. there. And we take it for granted. It happens 90 times in a game. But when that gets messed up, it's everything. And I feel like the drummer and the lead singer, it's that's the same relationship. If they don't have it with each other, then yeah. it won't work. And so I feel like if a quarterback, great quarterback, leaves a team, goes to another team and has new center, he may not be as good for that exact reason. And I think that's your Paul Westerberg analogy is like, you might be incredibly talented, but do not ignore that the, the chemistry you have with the people who you're doing this well 
with because it's not easy. Yeah. It's so precise. It's so, um, it's about precision. It's about uh, volunteering, giving, you know, sacrificing, yeah. um, taking ownership. It's it's just an amazing thing to, to, to be part of. Yeah, cool. Well, I, I can't disagree because uh, I've been doing it my whole life. I just can't shake it. <laughs> Did you ever play other instruments or were you only drums? Uh, only drums, man. That's all I do. I don't mess around with anything else. Some background vocals, but uh, nothing else. I I am a Luddite. I can't play anything on guitar. No, nothing. Piano, no. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> That's why I say I'm not a musician. I'm not even a drummer. I just play the drums. <laughs> I mean, you're a heartbeat. You're the heartbeat, really. It's what I do, man. <laughs> and and, and, I'll, and I'll quickly say, like, I, my understanding of this and my understanding of, um, you know, when I talk about that chemistry between the, 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 the two, you know, there, there are times when I feel like the lead guitarist, things sound a little bit off and I'll, you know, move towards them and I will change my physical and I, I will come over and snap a little bit. And we all just kind of find that together rhythm. And that's how you improve. And that understanding because in stand-up you're all by yourself you're not relying on anybody else right you where you're relying on other people and you guys have to listen and feel each other that vibration and that rhythm that you get together um that to me has transferred into other parts of my life my work um my understanding of how you know um just rhythm and even the way we use our CRM at work and understanding the, the how yeah. a business goes up and down and up and down. And then if you want to make change, okay. But it does, you know, if music is going like this all over the place, it's not music. Music goes like this and then it goes, whoa, you know? Um, yeah. And learning that has been just opened my eyes to the world. Yeah, cool, cool, awesome. Well, this this was just like the coolest application of, of uh, or, or the melding of, of research and, in, uh, no, research and music uh, that we've had on this program. So uh, I'm super glad that you took some time to tell the story to a wider audience here and participate in episode number 100, man. I mean, there is no greater <laughs> honor than the 100th episode. Um, uh, I thank you. And this is so much fun. I love, uh, I love that. You know, there's a selfishness. I love that you gave me an outlet to even do this and made it possible. So I thank you for that. And uh, keep it, keep it on. People love what you do, and keep keep on rocking. Do what you do, man. I appreciate. It. I've got no no plans to uh, to cancel it because people keep listening. So <laughs> maybe people say, hey, uh, if I if I submit this to a survey, people say, hey, I love that guest, but my God, that host has got to go. <laughs> Then I'm not going to do that survey because I don't even want to hear that answer. You know, That's the truth. <laughs> until you have, until it comes time for contract negotiations with yourself, yes, you can just right. uh, assume that you're the best guy in the business. <laughs> All right, Lee. Awesome. Thanks for being a guest on our hundredth episode. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's talk soon, of course. And rock and roll. <laughs>